Our next speaker, uh, I don't think needs any introduction here, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> Steve um, is a professor at uh, the University of uh, Colorado and uh, did his undergraduate work at Carleton and then uh, moved to Northwestern uh, for his medical degree and then migrated over to Denver and where he's been ever since at the University of Colorado. He's currently co-director of the Pediatric Pulmonary Hypertension Program, the director of the Ventilatory Care Program, and the director of the Pediatric Heart Lung Center. And in his spare time, he plays golf. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. And thanks, David. It's really such a pleasure to be here. Uh, just uh, Stanford has such legacy and prowess, and not just the old, but the new, not just the then and the next. Uh, all the, the basic science and novel technologies that we've heard discussed by all of our speakers, a lot of them were originated or developed and expanded here at Stanford, so it's great to be here, and it's great to see so many old friends. You know, it's been a fabulous day, so congratulations, David. It's really been wonderful. And it really reminds me that we think about respiratory medicine and the advances we need, that it takes a village. It takes pulmonologists, neonatologists, even pathologists, un unfortunately sometimes, but good new information. Uh, even MedPeds folks, Lisa Young, <laughs> having that adult component there, as well as our cardiology colleagues. And it takes merging the basic sciences with the clinical sciences. And I think it's uh, been an exciting day, and seeing a lot of the uh, advances in these fields has been wonderful. And so what I'd like to do is to take more of a clinical physiologic approach or a translational approach to the problem of pulmonary hypertension and BPD. But as noticed here, I call it pulmonary vascular disease in BPD because I want to talk more about the vascular phenotyping, the different aspects of the lung circulation that we're concerned about as we think about not only treating severe pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular dysfunction, many of the changes that we see with advanced disease, but if we understood the origins of the pulmonary vascular growth response that's impaired, uh, what uh, Dr. Elvira so beautifully highlighted, uh, if we understood the origins of BPD in relationship to vascular changes early, that perhaps there'd be novel preventive strategies. So our challenge as pediatricians then is different from perhaps our adult colleagues. We have to think more about disease inception in the prenatal period and the antenatal factors that drive that. And so what I'd like to do is to give you sort of a, a view of some of the clinical physiologic features, just a little bit of laboratory science to discuss some of these concepts. So the overall then goal is to think about our changing understanding of pulmonary vascular disease and related phenotypes in premature infants, discuss concepts regarding antenatal origins of early pulmonary vascular disease, and perhaps suggest clinical strategies, at least that will enable us to better design multi-center clinical trials that could help uh, better uh, understand and perhaps improve outcomes of our children who are prematurely born. And of course, it's such a great pleasure being back here. We've heard a lot that uh, a little more than a year ago, David organized another very successful meeting. And this was in honor of Bill Northway and, and Phil Sunshine's contributions and uh, to helping us understand this important problem of chronic lung disease after premature birth. And I especially like this image because it shows Bill Northway with Alan Job, and it talks about the old to the new the transition of many of the challenges back then and that we face now, the next challenges. And again, uh, Alan really has taught us that with such great breakthroughs in how we care for preterm infants in our nurseries, we're seeing a different kind of disease. The babies are far more extremely preterm. The nature of the injury is quite different. The way we use oxygen and ventilators, and, and Dr. Sunshine did a great job talking about the history of mechanical ventilation earlier. Um, all those things are different, but what Alan has taught us is that the antenatal factors now are very prominent. And identifying those risk factors may give us a window for successful intervention, intervention down the road. But of course, pulmonary vascular disease isn't new to the Stanford crowd. And Bill Northway, in his first paper, uh, spoke that for infants who died uh, in his uh, study, all patients had striking cardiomegaly and right ventricular hypertrophy. And we still face that problem. Even after the description in 1967 in the late 70s, Furon and colleagues and others were describing a 40 or 50 percent mortality in those infants who had sustained abnormalities by echo at four months of age. And here we have cardiac cath data from Boston Children's, which shows very similar numbers. 
So we didn't make much headway on the pulmonary hypertension side of the story, despite all the breakthroughs with surfactant, antenatal steroids, and many other interventions, and it remains a significant problem. And certainly we think of vasoreactivity and tone and giving vasodilators, but even infants who die with severe PBD can show some of the hallmarks of classical adult level idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. Intimal disease is shown here that's occlusive, smooth muscle uh, thickening, as well as adventitial proliferation, making for a strikingly abnormal, stiff, and obstructed vessel. And this can occur surprisingly early in the clinical course of some of our more severe infants. Now we have a, a pulmonary hypertension network, and you heard from Lisa Young some of the, the problems of trying to use these data, but I show this simply to highlight that if one thinks of the five classifications used to, to break apart or to group our uh, uh, causes of pulmonary hypertension, we apply them to children with pediatric disorders, group three, that is pulmonary hypertension associated with lung disease makes up almost 50% of that population. And the vast majority of these kids are either BPD, and as we heard earlier, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And this is sort of the tip of the iceberg, I think, because this only includes those kids identified who then get enrolled into a registry, and yet it doesn't cover the vast numbers of babies who are on nitric oxide or sildenafil and never make it to a, a pulmonary hypertension referral. Either they do well or other things change. But these are only within who we're consulting on. So I think BPD-related pulmonary vascular disease is a significant public health problem. So how should we think about this problem in preterm infants? And one could think of clinical phenotypes and divide them in a variety of ways. But perhaps the most striking would start off with early, and that is delayed adaptation of the lung circulation at birth. That is, failure of the pulmonary vascular resistance to fall shortly after birth, uh, to resuming the, uh, taking on the, uh, the, the function of oxygenation from the placenta. And it's the sustained elevation of pulmonary hypertension at such a level that we have extra pulmonary right to left shunt that can occur in preterm infants as readily or perhaps more readily than we see in term infants. And I highlight this because I think it's familiar ground for most everyone here, and yet we still fail to consider often the idea that preemies can have PPHN type physiology independent of the parenchymal lung disease. We also have some recent data from Husnan Mirza from Orlando where he sort of characterized the different patterns of transition. And I'll show you a little bit of data we looked by echo at pulmonary hypertension shortly after birth and what happened during the first few weeks of life and finds that that not only speaks to problems with oxygenation early, but also may be a harbinger of worse outcomes, uh, risk for BPD, death, prolonged ventilation. And then finally, we'll also have uh, early echo findings that really aren't as severe. That is, they don't, they're not markers of severe RV dysfunction or high levels of pulmonary hypertension, but maybe just as a simple biomarker that stuff's happening in the vasculature, that there's some injury going on or a stress to the vasculature that may then be associated or predictive of worse late outcomes, and we'll talk about some of those studies. Then, of course, is what we really spent a lot of time on, on those kids who develop late pulmonary hypertension. Somewhere beyond the first weeks of life, they have elevated pulmonary pressures, usually by echocardiogram. And this can occur uh, in the setting of sustained need for high levels of ventilator or respiratory support, high FiO2s, escalating care, cyanotic episodes. They may just have an echocardiographic abnormality at 36 weeks corrected age, and yet they're weeding out their oxygen. Or after discharge, they may come back with severe pulmonary hypertension, often associated with some sort of acute stress on their chronic susceptibility factors that we don't clearly understand. But these are things like RSV infection, influenza infection, development of pulmonary vein stenosis, which is being recognized more and more, and often doesn't appear until after 36 weeks corrected age. And then finally, it could be in the setting of progressive lung disease itself. Then finally, something that I've been fascinated by a lot of people is this idea of sustained pulmonary vascular disease or pulmonary vascular disease across the lifespan. And I won't talk about this, except there's some really interesting findings that if one follows these different cohorts over time, as Phil Levy has done here, you'll find the first year or two of life, there will be echocardiographic findings suggesting elevated pulmonary vascular resistance in the absence of striking pulmonary hypertension or RV changes. You'll also find Kara Goss did a nice cardiac catheterization study, 
and she took prematurely born young adults at about 25 years of age, exercise test them, measured right-sided pressures, and they had what we would now call borderline pulmonary hypertension. More than half of them had elevated mean pulmonary artery pressures that now is considered in the abnormal range, but on the low side. Asymptomatic, but there they are. And their vascular assessments of stiffness were increased. Cardiac output during exercise could not be sustained. So there's a cardiovascular phenotype as well as a lung phenotype for our survivors. And as we think of our adults, and we talk a lot about the risk for emphysema or COPD, we also have to face the fact that they have the myocardial changes and systemic vascular changes and perhaps stiffer vascular beds. And what does that mean long term still really isn't defined. So, but as pediatricians, we have to face these different phenotypes and time points. And I'd like to start by just discussing what happens early at the time of birth. And I'm showing this slide because it was published just a couple of years ago. But I like it because it shows some pulmonary vascular remodeling in preterm infants who died shortly after birth. And it illustrates they could show structural changes and that those structural changes correlated with the disease severity as marked by respiratory severity score. And in this paper, they talked about nitric oxide responsiveness and things along those lines. But I use this because I want to reflag the issue that indeed preterm infants can have pulmonary vascular disease early and it could be a significant contributor. Dr. Mirza's work in Orlando shows that if you look at the incidence of what he called delayed pulmonary vascular transition, or PVT, and plotted that against gestation, the patients who are less mature were more likely to have this delayed transition. What's also interesting here is there are different patterns of this change. If you look in the upper left box there, it shows pulmonary hypertension categorized by mild, moderate, uh, uh, moderate than severe, and you can see that that rapidly falls in most of the preterms and, and it stays low after the first few days of life. Then look at the bottom right, you have this other population, more of your classic PPHN crowd, where you see elevated pulmonary artery pressures that sustain through the time course. And overall in his analysis, he found that the delayed transition was associated again with lower birth weight and gestational age, but a higher risk for death and BPD, again within the first week or two of life, showing a significant role that it plays in that time period. Now we've all had the experience of having selected preterm infants where you could identify right to left extra pulmonary shunt by echocardiogram who are hypoxemic despite lung recruitment strategies or it's pulmonary hypertension disproportionate for what looks like relatively oligemic looking lungs. Often those are the kids with uh, prolonged premature rupture of membranes, oligohydramnios. And many of us and many sites have reported this kind of observation that by starting nitric oxide therapy, that could be a nice improvement in arterial to alveolar ratio as shown on the left, or a drop in oxygenation index as shown on the right, suggesting a striking pulmonary vasodilator response during this window of time. And so as a result, when a group got together from American Heart and American Thoracic Society to weigh in on what should we do with preemies and the idea of nitric oxide, we said, look, we know it doesn't prevent BPD. However, we would recommend that it, to use it in the setting that preterm infants with severe hypoxemia that's related primarily to PPHN physiology rather than parenchymal lung disease, particularly if associated prolonged rupture of memories and oligohydramnios, that it, it could be something that may be beneficial. Now this is a little bit different from what's recommended by Vermont Oxford. And many of us got this mailing, this newsletter from, from, a, from a Roger Soule, in which he mentioned that uh, centers spent nearly $300 million in one year on an unproven therapy. And it's true, we don't have multi-center trial data, we don't have meta-analyses, but what they refer to in terms of the lack of effectiveness and evidence is the use of nitric oxide and preemies for disease prevention early on for a brief period and not for the treatment of PPHN. And I think there's been a lot of confusion along those lines. So in other words, if we could better characterize and phenotype our infants, identify those who have significant pulmonary hypertension, that maybe there'd be a subgroup that would warrant further study, but in the dead of night, two in the morning, that's the kind of baby I'd probably go ahead and try on nitric oxide. Now there's a recent trial that came out, not a trial, but rather a, a data analysis. And this is from the pediatrics group, 
where they took uh, uh, diagnostic codes and there was no standard for what pulmonary hypertension was or wasn't, or what lung hypoplasia was or wasn't. And what they found is kind of nicely highlighted here. I think this is really intriguing. That if you took overall those patients who had presumed lung hypoplasia, PH here stands for pulmonary hypoplasia, without PPHN, there was no difference in survival in those who ended up getting nitric oxide or not. Take away that group, take out that group that has PPHN physiology with the pulmonary hypoplasia, and they see almost a 20 or 30 percent improvement in survival. Now, the numbers aren't great enough to reach uh, statistical significance, but it's a good example that early phenotyping and physiologic characterization is vital to better understanding our babies, understanding their underlying causes of hypoxemia, and will help us better form more effective multicenter trials, and I think this deserves uh, more study. So what do we make of the late pulmonary hypertension? And certainly it's associated with the severity of BPD as shown here. We have the results of three prospective studies, including Colorado, where if you had severe BPD, we saw about 30% of them had abnormal echoes at 36 weeks, up to 58% in Korea, 50% in Alabama, and overall 14 to 25% of these infants had evidence of pulmonary hypertension. So as I think about the underlying problems we face with pulmonary vascular disease, I think part of it is physiologically based in the idea that there are changes in tone and reactivity. And as I showed you before, changes in vascular remodeling that it could occur surprisingly early. And then finally, as Dr. Elvira nicely pointed out, changes in growth or angiogenesis, all of which can contribute to high pulmonary vascular resistance. The other feature we're very interested in, though, is how does this relate to BPD itself, this problem of poor alveolar growth? And that's where we became interested in the idea of angiocrine signaling, and it is endothelial epithelial crosstalk. And we know that must have something to do with developing vascular surface area, perhaps modulating the ability to grow alveoli, and based on work from uh, Dr. Rafi's lab in New York in adult models, of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, maybe even lung regeneration, even postnatally. So very interesting, what is it about this crosstalk that's contributing? So we think about prevention of BPD, we need to learn more about the early perinatal events and mechanisms. Can we identify these babies who are at risk? And then are there certain interventions that may preserve or restore normal distal airspace and vascular growth? And this just goes back to a long time ago, uh, this is sort of on an old yellow parchment, I think now it's old. But it was sort of what stimulated some of our thinking is with this model of PPHN physiology. Close the ductus of fetal sheep, 10 days or 14 days later deliver them, and they have extra pulmonary shunt, they're hypoxic from pulmonary vascular disease. But they also have smaller lungs. They also have uh, lower lung weight to body weight ratios, fewer vessels by vessel density, but their alveolarization was somewhat reduced as well. And we're fascinated by this. We then measured uh, proangiogenic factor, vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, was decreased. Its receptor, KDR, or VEGFR2, was decreased. And we found, though, that giving recombinant human VEGF back to these sheep prevented this PPHN and led to a normal transition at birth. So we got interested in some of the angiogenic signals beyond just the acute vasodilators we usually think about. Staying on the VEGF story then, if one gives a VEGF receptor inhibitor, one impairs vascular growth as highlighted here in neonatal rats. And then finally, one does disrupt alveolarization as shown here. You see in the upper panel that if you give this VEGF receptor inhibitor, SU5416, we disrupt VEGF signaling and impair alveolar and vascular growth in the infants, as shown in the upper panels here. But what's really interesting, if you let these animals go on longer, this does not improve spontaneously over time. And I think about this for the reasons that we mentioned before, PVD across the lifespan, developmental origins of pulmonary hypertension. How much of this adult story has its origins that we, has been masked, that we're missing from some of these perinatal events and things that, that may be determinants, and, but that's, that's all speculative right now. So at the time, we thought the vascular hypothesis that if you disrupt angiogenesis during critical periods of lung growth and pairs alveolarization, and that if we had more strategies to preserve endothelial cell survival and function, perhaps we decrease the risk for BPD. And so this is sort of a little cartoon that illustrates some of the work we've done. 
You know, if you take our, our, our VEGF uh, interest and apply it to these cells, the tan boxes on top are the alveolar type 2 cell. We have the pulmonary artery endothelial cells from fetal sheep in the bottom. And we find that if you give VEGF to alveolar type 2 cells, there's no response. They don't grow, proliferate, or change their fact in production. But if you give it when co-culture with endothelial cells, even when you block nitric oxide, one finds that it releases agents, in this case, hepatocyte growth factor, but we know that vitamin A or retinoic acid is another example. We think IGF may be another example. That it then stimulates both endothelial growth and angiogenesis, as well as promotes alveolarization, or at least type 2 cell growth in vitro. And so this highlights what we mean by the crosstalk mechanisms, highlights what we mean by angiocrine factors, even perhaps independent of growth or angiogenesis itself. So what does that happen? What does it mean clinically? Well, if we think about the origins of pulmonary hypertension and BPD, there was a nice review that highlighted striking features that suggest something that happens before birth must be very important. They have lower birth weight. Of course, they're more extremely preterm. Often they have intrauterine growth restriction, or their SGA, or they have oligohydramnios. So these antenatal drivers or determinants early before birth seem to play an important role or be associated at least with what's going on later, but the mechanisms aren't clear. So we thought that our picture was illustrated here that there must be antenatal vascular origins of BPD. That if you think about all the maternal stresses, including things like re that reduce utero-placental blood flow, but it could be maternal hypertension, preeclampsia, chorioamnionitis, that somehow it affects the placenta, which then alters fetal programming, and that this response may be mediated by disruption of angiogenic signaling. And there's enough evidence of this that I think it's been a growing idea. Karen Meston's work from Chicago shows very nicely that the placentas uh, that are uh, looked at histopathologically are highly predictive of late outcomes of BPD and pulmonary hypertension if they show vascular abnormalities supportive of vascular underperfusion. Then Karen has further characterized cord blood measures of angiogenic factors and shown that if there's decreased cord blood proangiogenic factors like VEGF, placental growth factors, and others, that there's a higher risk of being IUGR and having BPD. And then finally, uh, Chris Baker from Colorado showed that endothelial progenitor cells are decreased and are highly predictive of the making the subsequent diagnosis of BPD later in the course. So we put it together as something like this, that the vascular injury may not be unique to the lung, but for our focused interest on the lung itself, the decreased vascular alveolar growth is due to impaired angiogenesis, reducing surface area leading to these late risks of pulmonary hypertension. Other cord studies had shown similar kinds of findings. In preeclampsia, which is strongly associated with BPD risk, one finds that the cord blood has low insulin-like growth factor levels, low VEGF levels if others have reported. An elevation of S-FLIT, which we're fascinated by. S-FLIT itself is normally expressed by endothelial cells to promote growth and angiogenesis, but here it's in the blood. It's this soluble, almost a decoy receptor. And high levels are known to inhibit endogenous VEGF activity and perhaps placental growth factor activity. And so thinking along these lines then, we developed animal models to mimic either preeclampsia by giving S-FLIT or choriamnitis by giving endotoxin into the intraamniotic space. And one can see that there's disruption of placental vascular structure. These are slides that were, were really, this work was from Elizabeth Taglauer, who works with Stella Corambanis at Boston. She so strikingly disrupted patterns of trophoblast development in the placentas in both settings, as well as impaired vascular formation. And when she looks at the tissue, one can find increased pro-inflammatory signals, TNF-alpha, IL-6, that are increased in both of these animal models, and a decrease in a, a, a protective or anti-inflammatory cytokine, IL-10, suggesting that we can mediate or induce changes in the placenta that mimic some of the human placental changes that parallel some of the disease changes. What it means for the newborn rat pup is shown here, that as you give S-FLIT to mimic preeclampsia in rats, 
we put in the amniotic space, deliver the pups, and follow them for two weeks, you see striking decrease in alveolarization, increased right ventricular size, along with increased endothelial cell apoptosis. Using this model then, if you then block this uh, S-flit by giving a monoclonal antibody, you restore lung tissue structure, improve radial alveolar counts as shown here, and prevent the RVH as highlighted here. And then finally, we could do the same thing when we give IGF, IGF uh, BP3 therapy, it's binding peptide. Same kind of thing just with postnatal treatments. Again, we restore vascular structure can improve alveolarization and prevent right ventricular hypertrophy. Now, we've been most interested in this because there was a pilot study already of 121 preterms where they wanted to give recombinant human IGF to, to help promote angiogenesis, but not the lung, but for retinopathy of prematurity. And in this trial, they identified infants between 23 and 28 weeks gestation, randomized them to continuous infusion for up to 29 or almost 30 weeks post-conceptual age, and then followed them until term, compared them with uh, placebo or standard uh, therapies. And they saw absolutely no signal with retinopathy. So this is work Lois Smith and others were excited because VEGF is impaired, IGF interacts with VEGF, maybe we could fix ROP by giving IGF back early, didn't work. But for BPD, they had this, this is secondary analysis. They saw in their kids about an 89% reduction in severe BPD from the valuable set. So there seems to be a signal there that perhaps it matches what we're describing in the rodents. Then finally, clinically, just to talk about what we were thinking about from a cohort of kids in Colorado, that if we did echocardiograms to find early signs of pulmonary vascular disease during the first week of life, we found that it was subsequently associated with BPD at 36 weeks. Again, the echo's at seven days, the diagnosis at 36 weeks, that BPD or its severity was worsened simply by having septal flattening and often RV dilation, as shown here. And indeed, the risk for subsequent pulmonary hypertension, we knew that the abnormal echo at day seven was strongly associated with the subsequent development of pulmonary hypertension at 36 weeks. We finally more recently looked at what happens with late respiratory outcomes. In other words, once they're discharged from the NICU, what happens with the respiratory course? And we found that the simple metric by echocardiogram was strongly associated with more ER visits for respiratory problems, hospital admissions, and other kinds of problems. And that if one looked at this combination here of pulmonary vascular disease by echo at seven days was strongly associated with late respiratory disease, as was being on a ventilator at day seven, which has been previously reported, but the combination was especially strong in terms of predicting who's at risk. So we think this speaks to perhaps the pathobiology or mechanisms that may be involved, but independent of that, perhaps it'll help highlight at-risk kids who can now randomize for a variety of interventions, who maybe we can enrich that pool of subjects for clinical trials. Other studies have reinforced this. A recent study has shown that early pulmonary hypertension was associated, that is between, in the first two weeks of life, associated with higher rates of moderate to severe BPD, longer need for mechanical ventilation. And then finally, a big group from uh, the uh, database from Children's Hospital Research Network has shown that if you look at echoes in their kids, they found that if you had an abnormal echo, which was found in 22% of their population below 32 weeks, there was higher mortality, more use of the ventilator at 36 weeks, longer duration of ventilation, higher respiratory severity score, and more readmissions as shown in the box here, very much what we report in our smaller cohort. So overall then, in conclusion, I would look at the uh, pulmonary vascular disease as following this kind of a, a model here, at least it's something we would study. That is, it takes an abnormal fetal environment with prematurity, perhaps modulated by genetic factors that alter fetal programming. Perhaps endothelial dysfunction is important, and that could lead to abnormal endothelial cell-derived vasoactive factors, leading to changes in tone, reactivity, and structure as highlighted here, which may lead to BPD and pulmonary hypertension may further impair angiogenesis, reducing vascular bed, further contributing to this. And then perhaps there's decreased angiocrine signaling, which also further limits airspace development.
and that this may in part be due to critical antenatal factors as shown here, and we need to still be wary of all the postnatal issues that can modulate the course, and perhaps by early identification of these kids, modifying our standard therapies and things we worry about in the NICU can help improve outcomes even without a novel intervention or drug per se. And so uh, in conclusion, pulmonary vascular disease contributes to pathogenesis, pathophysiology, and cardiorespiratory outcomes of both BPD and, B and pH-associated BPD. Understanding disease phenotypes, the development of useful biomarkers may enhance our goals of treating severe pulmonary hypertension with artery dysfunction, preserving angiogenesis, or maintaining angiocrine signaling. And then I just want to thank our two of our surgery residents who uh, who really did the, the, the most of the work of the SFLIT and the IGF. They did two years from the residency and the lab. They were fantastic. And a couple of our PRAs, Taylor Nellen and, and Greg Cedar. So thanks for your attention.